Oh, man. Dojin aren't all explicit. <laughs> well, the good ones are. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Macos Delta Recap Show, Episode 7. This is EXO along with the magical girl who's in kitty cat disguise, Celia Rose. Hello. Guys. And we have the Macross Mecha expert, Chad. Meow. <laughs> <laughs> it's the best I could come up with. <laughs> All right. So, Macross Delta Episode 7, Behind Enemy Lines. Uh, let's go with Chad. What's your overall reaction to that episode? Very good episode. Very strong episode. Um, lots of interesting stuff going on here. Um, also some silly stuff, but very entertaining. Uh, and uh, just came away with a really good feeling. Again, like another excellent installment. And I can't wait to sort of get into it and break down the, the bits and pieces because uh, there's a lot to discuss. A lot happened here. It's, it's, uh, it's good stuff again. I don't want to jump ahead, but we finally get an answer to the whole Apple question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what did you think of this episode? So I know I say this a lot, but it was really good. Um, I know. I really I, enjoyed it. It was another good episode. Oh, it was so good. Like, we started to get uh, the vibes that we had, like, in the first couple episodes of Macross Delta, where we had the sillier parts, but we also had some really uh, serious moments and, and some important reveals about how the VAR syndrome is actually affecting people and what Windermere has been doing all along. And overall, I think that the tonal shifts were really good too. How it was able to go from the really silly, you know, cat puns and pretending to be Voldorians, but also handling the drama of war really well within the same time frame, sometime within minutes of each other. It was really good. I liked it a lot. Yeah, it's a really good balance between the funny parts and the really heavy dramatic parts. One of my uh, favorite ones is. Um... Again, I don't want to get ahead, but the two little kids, that was pretty, oh, pretty fucking sad. That for was her. so sad. All right, let's start at the beginning with the... The episode sort of starts off with a bit of um, history of the Macross universe, particularly the protoculture and their relationship to the civilizations that are currently active in the galaxy right now. Typically, when um, uh, Macross features this kind of intro, it's because they're going to feature a story element that is relevant to this particular bit of background. Um, so I figured that that was going to come up with the episode, and it did. But overall, it was a good little sort of reintroduction. Uh, we didn't get much, but we just got the facts, and then they moved sort of like right into um, you know the thrust of the main story for the episode. But it was a great way to show that um, the humans, the Zentradi, the Ragnans, and of course, um, although we don't know it when we're watching the intro, the Voldorians um, are... Uh, another race and they were all sort of seeded by the protoculture to one extent or the other don't forget the Windermerians. yes the Windermerians as well yeah did you guys see the bird <laughs> the bird yeah. illustration i knew you were gonna bring that up <laughs> i saw that and my heart said sarah gnome and i got very excited for a minute my heart fluttered um <laughs> we were also confirmed in this clip at the very beginning that there are ruins on other planets for the species that have been seeded by the protoculture. Yeah. And that's going to play a big role later since Royd is trying to seek out those other ruins. So this may be on a bigger scale than we were initially expecting, where it's just this cluster that Royd is looking at right now. But since now that it's been confirmed there are more ruins in other parts of the galaxy, that there is a possibility to expand to those. It's a little hint, but it's enough to imply some really heavy stuff. Uh, Chad? Let's go back to you about the beginning as far as the hacking scene with Rena. So, uh, yeah, the, the sort of episode begins with uh, the Aether sort of hiding among the asteroids that are around orbit of uh, Voldor. And it looks like our heroes are trying to figure out some way to get past um, what looks like a fairly uh, sizable defense fleet and some satellites orbiting that have been set up to sort of form a defensive perimeter. And we see a new ship design, or at least um, maybe it's we've seen it before, but we see it up close this time. And it's definitely something that we have not seen before, as far as I can remember. Um, it looks something similar to the uh, stealth cruiser, 
from Macross Frontier, um, but we actually already we also see a stealth cruiser in the same frame as this ship, and it's clearly very different. Um, and I, I I haven't seen this design before this up close. I don't think. Um, so it's, uh, it's definitely noticeable for me and they have like a big Windermere sort of emblem on the front of it and whatnot. Um, this is the only good look we get of it, but it's, it's an interesting design nonetheless. And, uh, they quickly sort of determined they have to figure out a way to, um, hack through because they can't obviously fight their way through, um, that many sort of, uh, enemies. And so they have this rather entertaining and really kind of silly, um, hacking sequence, which doesn't even really come across as hacking. It's more like <laughs> almost magic in a way and just, and like fun and entertainment, I think more than anything else. Cause it's just, it's pure, it's, it's pure visual nonsense, really. Cool. Um, Celia, so yeah, this is pretty much a magical girl sequence, like uh, Chad said. This hacking sequence was like A+. plus. It was really cool. <laughs> uh, the graphics were great. Reyna finally got her chance to shine. Um, she really hasn't had her moment yet. So far, everything's been focusing on Mikumo and Freya um, and Makina a little bit, just because she's the mechanic, uh, the main mechanic on the um, for Chaos and for the Delta Squadron. Um, in this one, we are also introduced to a new song called Silent Hacker. And based on the vocals that I heard in the episode, it might be a solo track for Reyna's voice actress. So this might be a song just for her during her sequence. This was really cool. Like Reyna having the cause to like physically tear apart the the like frame of the of the security around the planet. Like that was really cool. Um, and support from Makina. It sets up what we're gonna see more of Makina and Reyna's relationship, anyways since that's highlighted um, more frequently in this episode. So it was a nice way to kind of just kickstart that and give Reyna a time to show what she's best at doing. Yeah, so they, they finally get to infiltrate, and we see them in the forest with um, trying to get into their disguises. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and everyone's putting on their ears and their stripes. <laughs> I think my favorite scene from that particular sequence, there's a couple of them. So like when Freya appears and all she's doing is like, she's making cat puns and she's all like, yeah, which is and adding it to the end of like her sentences, which is a total, like, it's a great comedic way to add in cat sounds. And, and Mirage has a gun and she's like, you need to quit it. <laughs> <laughs> and then Hayate looks super unsure about the cat ears and then Messer's like stop whining and he steps out and he's all in his full gear it was just great Messer in cat ears <laughs> I admit that I ha laughed out loud when he appeared on screen it was the funniest thing because he looks so <laughs> serious about this mission but he's all dressed up like, <laughs> like a, a cat, cat man <laughs> <laughs> it was great yeah, you got to give it to those subbers also, you know, working those um, cat punts into the subtitles. I, I was, was like, actually oh, curious about that it. because it, it felt like, yeah, I think some of these are just like, yeah, part part of the sub sort of thing, like apologies and impossible <laughs> and memories instead of memories. And yeah, I, I was thinking, yeah, I think some of these are actually just subtitle work and not necessarily, you know, uh, not necessarily what there's what they were saying in, in the episode. If you listen to the dialogue, because um, in Japanese, when there's a character that's kind of like the cat girl type of thing or cat boy or whatever, mm -hmm. um, yeah. there's a character in Love Life that does this also. They'll put nya at the end of a word or at the end of a sentence because nya is like the sound for a cat in Japanese. And okay. Freya does do that. She keeps sticking it in her in her <laughs> speech, which is why Mirage is like, you quit it with the, <laughs> quit it with the cat puns. <laughs> Don't say yeah, basically. <laughs> and the Vordorians don't talk that way, right? No, they, they... don't. They don't actually. <laughs> I was listening to one of the vendors that shows up later in the episode because the sub yeah. did give him one about like fresh produce. Um, <laughs> That's true. But I didn't hear a nya in his speech, so I'm like, all right, maybe that one was, <laughs> maybe that one was some uh, some creative liberty taken by the subbers, but it I was funny. So. <laughs> um. Chad, so they, they walk their way into the to the city and they've got to do some um, reconnaissance. Yeah, so they get down to the planet's surface and they're like, you know, trying on their costumes and stuff. And we get a little bit of, um, I guess, world building. Um, they talk about um, 
62 percent of Voldor's land mass is covered in marshes and its exports are lumber fruit and spring water and then they end with like zero strategic value you know <laughs> so everybody's kind of wondering like why Windermere the Windermereans are here um, but then they talk a little bit more about uh, the Voldorians themselves how they were originally modified felines they say and um, they sort of decide to get this plan together they break up into three different teams and uh, of course it's a good opportunity to get mirage and hayate together and for mikumo to go off on her own which she does and everybody else is like where did she go she's already disappeared she was supposed to be with freya but yeah just kind of she went off and did her own thing so it was kind of funny i also noticed and this is sort of like a little um uh, thing for uh, Macross 7 fans. There was a, a rickshaw driving through the town at one point uh, in the earlier parts when the characters are still like exploring, walking through. That is the exact same design as um, uh, the one from uh, Macross Dynamite 7. Uh, except a different color. It's instead of green, it's uh, it's sort of like a sand color, but uh, Elma from Macross Dynamite Seven has uh, a sort of amphibious rickshaw that can drive on the ground and also go through water, and it is the exact same design. Um, I I even took a screenshot of it, and I was like, oh, that's kind of a neat little you know shout out to the Macross Seven fans. Cool, you got to send me that screenshot. Also, do you have that rickshaw on your site? I the do. Macross yes, manual? it is in the uh, <laughs> it is in the uh, Macross Seven section under civilian vehicles and independent groups, and it's just a little amphibious rickshaw, and it's uh, it's got a colored picture and everything, so it looks uh, in, everybody can check it out. Celia, I want to jump ahead to the they're walking through the city. Yeah, you mentioned the Apple um, vendor. Um, so when we're still following the crew with Messer and Kaname and everybody, we find out at least I haven't heard it before. Um, they mentioned Sade's Knoll as something that's causing the VAR. And mm-hmm. I don't remember that being mentioned in prior episodes, um, but we we find out about it when um, Kaname and Messer stage like a fight in front of the guards that they suspect are infected. And, and she sneaks a blood sample. And then um, they said that there are, that the side knoll is present in their blood. Uh, and that's what's causing the VAR. And I don't mm-hmm. remember that being said before, that it was that particular element that was... Um, present in people that was being activated do you guys remember yeah. see, hearing it no. in previous episodes i do not no. remember that term specifically no yeah so i thought it was important that they mentioned it this time around because um, now we're starting to get more specific and figuring out just how this var and the wind singing is all working together messer looks like kiba from naruto <laughs> <laughs> we get a, a few other like small little things just before we go on to the next scene we have uh, hayate's cat allergies are going sort of wild <laughs> at this point which is great i'm really glad that they remembered that um, uh, they sort of set that up the in the earlier episodes all swarm on him. yeah it was hilarious yeah they're all like you know <laughs> trying to give him some home remedy or something like that and uh, we also have a brief like a very um not not necessarily that brief but a a, a shot of um some sort of large space vessel, which they look up the sky at the sky at. So it's sort of like uh, they they all look up and they see, you know, the obviously the Windermirians presence here on Voldor, and uh, we see what almost looks like um, uh, an asymmetrical. Um, quarter class vessel in some respects but it's it's not a quarter class vessel that we've seen before um and so i don't think it is but it has that sort of look because it's got two very large forward booms that are sort of differently shaped right so it it reminds me a bit of the macross quarter but it's uh it's a different it's definitely a different design uh, altogether but interesting nonetheless so we get into a scene where Hayati starts talking about how silly the the mission seems to him. Yeah, yeah, he he has this uh, moment, and I'm I'm really glad that the writers sort of put this in, um, because it's a great way to sort of uh, poke fun, I guess, a little bit at what they're doing, but also let the audience know that the, yeah, they're you know, the writers are aware of the silliness of sending pilots to do an infiltration mission. 
Um, but then Mirage sort of like talks a bit about like why it is that Hayate and the rest of them are all here doing this mission. And uh, she recalls a conversation she had with Arad in which Arad stated to her experiences <laughs> build character. And he had this great sort of uh, Ragnan saying, I guess, that was uh, the deeper a jellyfish has swum, the more delicious it is and, and whatnot. So it's sort of like a, something that a, a mentor would say to a protege kind of thing. Right. So it was uh, a, a bit of a, a cool little sequence there. There and a little flashback for Mirage. Oh, Captain yeah. Boulders and his jellyfish. <laughs> <laughs> and Reina, too. She loves a jellyfish. Yeah, and then um, Freya runs off because she smells the apples, uh, Celia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she almost <laughs> blows cover. This is the first time she almost blows cover on this mission, is when she smells the Windermere apples and she exclaims something about her rune feeling excited and then she runs off and just totally abandons her unit so that she can go find these apples uh and we actually get a name to the to the apples also they're the windermere Exdel apples and and that's the kind that we've been seeing so far the ones with all the uh, the brown scarring on them and they're also freya's favorite apple from windermere mm-hmm. I get yeah. a kick out of how Freya's rune like totally gives away her disguise. <laughs> it's yeah. like clear to anybody that she's a that everybody that she's a Windermirian because of her rune is just like right on her forehead, just doing its own thing. And it's like, uh, yeah, that kind of like blows your cover, but uh, nobody ever says anything about it. It's hilarious. <laughs> But not only that, these are pro- practically um, universally famous singing group the walk here walking around with cat ears and nobody recognizes them, right? Because it's like, <laughs> this is like awesome superhero disguise that they're in, cat ears and face paint. <laughs> you know? Well, I think oh. we're meant to believe that the disguises are a little bit more involved than they actually appear yeah. in the animation. I mean, they would have to be, right? But uh... Of course. <laughs> I don't think um, Hayate's cap with the cat ears would, would work. <laughs> <laughs> but um, as far as their, um, the Valdorian guards have cat ears on their helmets also yeah that was a nice I thought that was really cool I, yeah i did think that oh, the same i thought that was a really nice touch and how they have like ventilation and also like the yeah. ability to have like some hearing out of them i thought that was yeah. very clever you know hayate also um starts to make a connection um between the windermere i should say and the apples um and mirage sort of almost dismisses it wondering like it's not really a thing but it seems like hayate sort of making the connection at least at the start and it turns out that later in the episode we actually get more confirmation of that um Personally, I just wanted to say it was is cool because I've had some theory about these apples from the beginning, almost from the beginning of the series, because they kept on coming up over and over again in one episode after another. And even if they didn't specifically mention the apples, it was sort of like it was a it was they were they appeared at least visually so that you never totally forgot about them. So you're, I was I was assuming there was going to be some connection between those damned apples and what happens in the rest of the episode. And I'm glad that this uh, it looks like with episode seven, we finally have some confirmation of that theory. Woohoo, you got one. Yeah, <laughs> I finally got one right. <laughs> So Freya runs off again to because she hears or she sees the color of some song. Yeah, oh, that scene like that hurt me. <laughs> that scene. That was pretty sad. That scene was very sad. So Freya um, hears a song and and she recognizes it as a specific color, but she doesn't tell us what it is. And when she tracks it down, running away from the unit again, and they follow her. Um, you see two young children outside of uh, what appears to be a Batrade unit for Voldor that's just standing there and the girl is singing um, one of Walkyrie's songs to it and they're crying to get his attention and the two children um, that are there it's their father that's sitting inside the inside the unit and he is possessed with the bar syndrome and he's not responding to their music it's that really sucks. sad yeah it was pretty sad well and, yeah, and it was the described girl... as uh Ca- captain alberto lara zabal an ace pilot yeah. of the voldor nuns fleet for uh voldor oh what was really sad was when the girl um like she gives up and she's all like while well, music doesn't work it doesn't yeah. fix the var because she tried it and it didn't work like clearly not understanding the power of the fold waves and and that effect but really mm-hmm. like losing heart in the fact that what has worked in the past to cure the VAR isn't working on their dad. And then Freya 
overhears them and it says, that's not true. And once again, almost blows cover if it weren't for Mikumo snatching her out of the trees and holding her back. <laughs> Chad, what, do you, what did you think of Mikumo's disguise? <laughs> just as, as as ludicrous as the rest i suppose uh, but very very cute um and that's i think that's kind of the point it, it was actually kind of funny how they managed to get everybody into cat costumes um just through you know the nature of the voldorians and what they are and i thought it was like wow that was it's a pretty funny way to introduce a you know get some cat cat folk in here for uh for some fun uh but it was great and um mikuma also um sort of uh reveals that She's on like a surveillance or a reconnaissance mission, and she's using these uh, sort of um, machines, um, what she calls uh, micro drones or something like that, I think. Yeah. Um, that mm -hmm. are basically in the shape of uh, insects, uh, cicada shaped micro drones, she says, that have sensors and cameras. And she's planted them um, all over, including uh, this one Voldorian building that's holding uh, a top secret intergovernment meeting between uh, Lord Royd of Windermere. And uh, obviously one of the government representatives of Voldor. Yeah, Roy seems to be having a meeting with one of the, at least the important leadership figures. Um, we're not really given specifics as to how Voldor's government works, but we can at least assume that this guy that he's talking to is one of the guys in charge, if there's more than one, um, where he's trying to negotiate access to the ruins. Um, on Voldor in particular, the Paragonal ruins are a holy place. And Windermere is basically just set up shop in those ruins and have it like heavily um, secured with armed uh, forces all around it to make sure no one gets into it. And what we find out from the, the leader is that Royd has been studying the protoculture for a while. Um, and he says that he's read his papers that he's published. So this is something that is very motivating for Royd and has been for a long time for him to be publishing papers and and studying you know what the protoculture means and how that affects them as as Windamerians. uh and actually the leader makes a comment that leads into um basically turning on its head what we've already known about Windermere so far he says Windamerians like to blow up friend info indiscriminately with dimensional weapons and we find out that these weapons uh have been banned by by nuns um, and that Windermere fired one during their war for independence, but they blamed it on nuns. They said they were the, saying that they didn't do it, but New UN Spacey was responsible. Uh, yeah, it was interesting. It was nice to see an in-universe, you know, affirmation of you know Royd's sort of political motives and his just his his propaganda sort of speech, and that other people are kind of like both aware of it. Um, may be wise to it, but also somewhat sympathetic in some respects. They also use this as an opportunity to talk about um, uh, the last humanoid races that the protoculture gave birth to were those in the uh, Brisinger cluster, um, which is why, like, Royd believes they are the true heirs of the protoculture that sort of, like, go, you know, sort of um, works to his advantage as far as his pro his, uh, his propaganda and what he wants to lead everybody else in the cluster to believe. And actually, I, I think maybe instead of expanding, you know, the the scope of Macross Delta out of the cluster, I think in some respects, this almost sort of reinforces its limited scope. Um, again, it's sort of, it again frames what Royd is doing within the confines of the cluster rather than anything else beyond it. Um, it sort of reestablishes that this is what he's interested in. So I don't know if he's necessarily want if he necessarily wants to go outside of the cluster and you know make any sort of big conquering moves towards you know the the new unified government or you know anybody else outside of the cluster. He seems again sort of um, always always framed within the cluster, always you know concerned with what happens in this cluster and what the destiny of these races are. Yeah, I don't know how good uh, the Winnemarians would be about long term plans because you know they only have like a 30 year lifespan and yeah sure they could set it up for future generations but i think it still limits them they can't get into anything long and protracted because they yeah they simply they simply don't have the time so they're yeah. all about you know doing things now getting things done and just the the immediate goal yeah it also explains um why they're so aggressive because of their short lifespan you know why they're just so indiscriminate about attacking friends or foe because whatever gets them farther along their goal, that's what they're going to do. So, Ooh, there's a thing with Makumo that I think has a double meaning to it. 
when when Freya is like, even though Royd is saying in front of her, like while they're spying using the uh, the drones that Mikumo installed. Like, he's not denying that Windermere used the dimensional weapon during their war for independence. And then Kaname confirms it with their data. And, mm-hmm. and Freya's like, no, that can't be. It was, you know, it was new UN Spacey. <gasps> and, yeah. and she's, like, really shocked by that. And then Mikamo looks at her and says, you know, look at me. Are you really seeing me? Or are you seeing something else? <laughs> and in that moment, like, it's, you know, it's intended for the purposes of, you know, what you see is not always the truth with the Windermereans, but also about Mikumo. I think that's yeah. hinting at something much deeper with Mikumo. It definitely plays into the mystery around the character, for sure. So mm-hmm. the, the show is always giving us excuses to sort of question uh, Mikumo, like what she's up to, what she is all about, what her motives are. Is there a possibility that she could go one way or the other? You know, it's just like there's nothing necessarily explicit as yet but there are little you know hints little pushes little nudges you know uh, every episode that we get that's you know something's mysterious about her or she might not be on the level or she might have her own sort of mind about certain things right and this is sort of like another example of that yes it was a great nudge yeah and within that conversation there was a flashback with um with freya i don't know if that's exactly what she was seeing when we've seen her before in her other flashbacks before it was like a this huge fire, but in this flashback, it's this huge um, sphere of energy. I don't necessarily think that puts the earlier flashback into question. I mean, it could still as just as easily the dimensional uh, weapon effect could have caused that building that she was staring at in the first flashback to be burning. That's mm-hmm. you know, it's easily an effect of a dimensional weapon at that point. So it could still be in line with um, with uh, Freya's sort of memories. And we have no, we don't necessarily have any reason to question Freya's flashbacks as yet. Um, she's personally seen things in a new light based on, you know, information that's coming to her. And she's certainly looking at what the Windermerians taught her as something, you know, that wasn't exactly true, but that doesn't invalidate anything that she's experienced as yet. It's just shedding new light on the same events. She's seen things from a, from a, uh, a more wizened perspective. But other than that, I think her, I think her flashbacks are pretty much on the level. Um, well, that's the thing. It, it's, this is just memories, but another difference between the, the first flashback that we saw is that she's holding her uh, music device. In this one, she's holding an apple. So that's a kind of like a different type of memory, or it could mean that this is a different event that she's looking at, or she's remembering two events within the same context. Or it could it's even possible. be an animation error. It could be that. Yeah. <laughs> they might have they might have uh, drawn in something for cool effect, but forgotten the items that link them together who knows when you're working well, on a limited a, time frame anything's possible it was a traumatic event for sure yeah but there might yeah. be some different interpretations as time goes on mirage does does mention that uh it was the windermerians themselves who used the um the war during the, sorry the dimensional weapon during their war of independence seven years ago and they were told that, at least from Freya's point of view, they were actually told that it was the Earthlings that were responsible. Um, regardless, the event was, again, like something that would be traumatic. And I think Mirage mentions that millions of civilians were lost in that particular um, dimensional weapon detonation. So it's it's something pretty heinous and, and pretty intense for anybody to live through. Oh, poor Freya. She's so traumatized. Yet she's so, like, she's so pleasant. <laughs> I think that really says something about her resilience. Like, if you look at that flashback, she's pretty darn close to that dimensional weapon as it's going off. Yeah, that's another thing that kind of, like, questions, like, how accurate her memory is. You know, you know? she's pretty close, and, and she's experienced war but she still puts on a brave face for everybody and tries to keep a positive attitude. And I think that speaks volumes about her resilience as a character. (laughs) If Indiana Jones can stand in front of a mushroom cloud, Freya can stand in front of that big giant (laughs) scary Yes. Well, let's hope that Macross Delta doesn't nuke the fridge here. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, God. (laughs) So let's jump ahead. We see um, Gramya talking to Heinz, Celia. Gramia was totally aware that Heinz has, was brought to go see the scar. Um, and he says to him that the scar itself and the activation of the weapon, even if he doesn't say it explicitly, uh, that it bore holes into the hearts of the Windemirians. And the only way to fill it is through revenge. 
So he's not saying outright to Heinz. I think he's not saying explicitly, you know, we have to fight this because of what happened. But he is implying that Heinz's role is important. And if he feels any doubts, that he should probably erase them from his mind and know that he is on the right side of Windermere. Chad, do you think revenge is the best way to fill that hole? No, it can only it can only end well, right? Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. It's a pretty no, I, big I hole. Think, <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I think Grammy is being clever about what he's telling to Heinz because he he doesn't want to come across as like uh, an an easy to dismiss, you know, um, mu- uh, mustache twirling bad guy kind of thing. So he's sort of he's putting um, he's using the the collective sorrow of the Windermere people and their you know who survived and, you know, had to live through the war of independence and, and whatnot as sort of motivation for Heinz to keep doing his thing just in case he's having any doubts. Um, and we haven't really seen much of Heinz wrestle with what he's doing other than physically. Um, we don't really know all that much about him yet, about where he stands on things, about how he sees things. All we know is that he's sort of getting taken in by his older brother, Keith, and His father is obviously sort of pushing him down a road. And um, so that sort of remains to be seen what he's thinking and, you know, how he's responding to all this. But so far, he feels, you know, like he's going along with it and he feels like a pawn in in many respects. So um, hopefully we'll see a little bit more to him that gives him uh, that writes some more complexity for the character and hopefully gives him a little bit more of something to do. All right. So back at Voldor, um, we see the gang back all together in the forest and then Mikumo just kind of like disappears right when Freya is kind of like talking about proving herself to her <laughs> poor Freya every time <laughs> Freya like feels this like surge of energy and pride and she's like Mikumo I'm gonna prove myself to you then Mikumo's not there <laughs> <laughs> and she doesn't realize it until like she's almost done with her motivational speech for herself um, yeah Mikumo wanders away from the group because she senses a wind like she mm-hmm. says, what is this wind? And then she just vanishes and, and leaves the group once again. And no one thinks anything of it. I think Reina even says she's the uh, queen lone wolf. Yeah. I guess this is not new for, for Mikamo to just vanish. Um, They're used to it. And then that's when, <laughs> after she vanishes, then we are given another awesome sequence with Makina and Reina while they <laughs> break into the secure zone around the ruins. Yeah, they're like hacking security drones around the complex and just sort of doing some, you know, reconnoiter of the protoculture ruins before they dive right into a sequence where they're, you know, they're going right through the fence, right up to the front door sort of thing. It's just, it's all like hilarious. It's, it's so like, you know, it's sort of over the top spy-ish kind of thing. Um, like you'd see in almost like a, I guess a parody of a spy film sort of thing. Um, but it's all fun. It's, it's definitely, it's definitely lots of, uh, lots of, uh, interesting visuals and lots of, uh, fun moments for both Raina and Mac. And actually speaking of which we get like a lot of backstory on the two of them here, um, while they're doing all their hacking and infiltrating and everything else. Um, they're sort of like working in perfect sync and Hayate comments on this to which uh, Kaname jumps in and sort of has a, a lot to say about the two of them. And we get a little bit of backstory that, that uh, tells that Makina and Reina were actually at each other's throats originally and uh, didn't like each other from the moment they first met. And uh, they actually had to cancel certain shows and they were described by Kaname as oil and water and just did not mix. So it took a long time apparently for the two of them to come around. But now it's just like looking at them at this point, they're they're inseparable. And uh, it, it, it feels like Kaname is, is very proud of them both, you know, how, how far they've come and what they've done. Oh, that was actually very shocking to find out they hated each other at first because <laughs> they're like perfect space girlfriends. Yeah. And then to find out that they actually used to like fight. Like what they were showing when they were talking about canceling shows was Makina and Reina actually looking like they're about ready to punch each other on stage. <laughs> like it was bad and it was just it was great backstory i love them so much and they got their time to shine i love that they're basically partners in crime as well and that they do everything with their own flair it was a great sequence i loved it a lot yeah i wonder what happened to it that they finally like kind of hooked up you know or something it's easy wonder... true love's kiss alex <laughs> 
<laughs> no, man. Sure we need a deleted kids. scene Conquers or some all. sort of uh, <laughs> <laughs> some sort of douching, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it looks like the there's a Mikumo doujin, and I think I saw one for Freya also. <laughs> oh yeah, somebody posted it on Facebook already, and I was like, wow, that was fast. Like, wake me when it's Team Macarena. Yes, I want Macarena. <laughs> I want Macarena doujin. Please and thank you. <laughs> but they keep cutting out these like bunny holes <laughs> everywhere when they're trying to break it's in. It's so cute because Makina has a bunny motif. Like the little bow on her head is like bunny ears. And then uh-huh. her goggle readouts are all in bunny shapes. I love it. She's darling. Okay, so yeah, they, they finally break in and they end up in a massive cavern, Chad. Yeah, it's like uh, this sort of underneath the protoculture ruins, there's a very large cavern um, with these massive silos inside. And um, I guess the, the team sort of quickly discovers that they're filled with water and they also find some apples along the way. Um, and Messer reappears and sort of rejoins the team and they're sort of like making, sort of investigating what's going on here and why everybody is, you know, why these supplies are here. And I think it's uh, Kanema that makes the observation that the amount of water is immense. And uh, even if this is meant for, uh, meant to be drinking water and supplies for an army, it's way, way too much than, uh, you know, than, than an army needs. And so they're wondering what it could all like possibly be for. And uh, then uh, I think it's Raina at one point mentions that um, uh, 61.4% of all VAR syndrome cases have been in the military, apparently. And uh, I think the pieces start to come together for a lot of them there at that point. And, uh, you know, we have quickly have some revelations afterwards as well. Oh, yeah, that's when they find all the water bottles. Mm-hmm. Windermere has been uh, bottling water from Voldor and you, selling it basically to the military, and they're distributing it throughout their forces. And, and this water, uh, when they looked closer at it, had a pill inside of it that I assume would probably dissolve by the time the shipment arrived at whatever uh, base camp it was going to. And that just like screamed layers of shady to me, sticking drugs in people's drinks. Never a good idea. But we find out that it, this pill that's inside the water is key to activating some of the components that are in Voldorian water in order to activate the VAR syndrome and make people more susceptible to the Song of the Wind. Yeah, they seem. The, it seems like the components are sort of non sort of important on their own but once combined they actually create something that can activate the var syndrome and then um you know heinz does his thing and uh voila you've got either sort of disruption or uh sort of uh, pacification Mm -hmm. freya even finds a big box of apples too (laughs) yeah she does those extel apples and hayate puts two and two together that if you mix the apple and the water that it creates high levels of Seidsnol, which is key to activating the VAR syndrome in individuals. They have actually to really have that like present this in part. their systems. Yeah, I, yeah, I was going to say, I really like that they came up with that instead of just, you know, oh, yeah. the apples are what's responsible. That was yeah, really smart. It makes it, uh, it makes it more more believable. And also it doesn't make um, everybody else look like a bunch of idiots, right? Because they, you would think that they would have some sort of product testing and quality control on all sorts of imports and stuff, just like they do in, you know, real life and whatnot, right? So it was kind of, uh, it was a good that it, it was a, a step removed that it required, you know, some additional investigation and thinking. I also like that it was Hayate that sort of stumbled upon this because of all of the talk and character work that was done uh, between Makana and Reina. Mm-hmm. And he sorts yeah. of, you could see him sort of taking this all to heart. And then he, you know, he looks at the two of them and they're like, oh, look at them. And they're joined at the hip. They work together. You know, they're inseparable. And when they're combined together, their talents you know, help and assist each other and they can achieve great things. And then he, you know, he puts that philosophy to work in his own investigation. And all of a sudden he comes up with the idea of putting the apples in the water together. And then the breakthrough happens. It was great. It was naturalistic. And it also like, you know, tied into the, the good character work that they've been doing this episode about those two characters. <laughs> so Celia, let's, let's go back to um, Mikumo one more time before we get into the, the big finale. Yeah. Um, what's going on with her? All right. So when Mikumo first wanders away from the group, it's because she says she senses a wind. 
Um, and it leads her to the paragonal ruins. Uh, and she feels summoned. Like she, she actually says, you know, out loud when she's walking towards them, you know, who is calling me here? And once she gets there, she, I mean, she stands there for a moment, but then her first impulse is to sing. Mm. And I don't know if she's thinking, um, if she's thinking that it might work like the song of the wind, because she has been particularly curious about Heinz and how it works, uh, being a wind singer and how it w- resonates with the ruins. Cause she's mentioned it a couple times. Um, but also I think it's interesting that that was the first thing that she decided to do. And I wonder how much of that is the draw of those ruins. She felt some like she was being called to them. And I wonder if the ruins were also calling her to sing there as well. Girl can't resist the stage she with the can't. spotlight. She's a diva. I think she's been feeling it too for a while as well. This actually mm-hmm. might make sense of some of the earlier scenes in Macross Delta where um, Mikuma was sort of talking about... She was talking about Heinz's song and and how she could feel a, a pull by it, um, and that sort of you know was it was it actually his song or was it was she feeling also some of the uh, effects of the protoculture runes and what they're capable of or was she being drawn to those sort of same sorts of things, and then she had like various moments on her own where she's like thinking about what it is that she's doing almost like she's looking for a purpose or something like that so it's clear that she's sort of looking for something as well and she's being like either either pulled to or you know directly led to some sort of uh connection with the the protoculture ruins and um at least the 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 wind singer and stuff might have something to do with it but we don't know yet but she's kind of i think one of the reasons that she's going off on her own and stuff is because she unlike the other characters senses something else that's going on i guess with Mm -hmm. the with this whole situation and she you know she's drawn to it and she's going to go off and investigate on her own and try and figure it out as well and she looks really good in this scene also it's with um, so the pretty. way they draw her. Yeah, yeah, it is a great sequence, yeah. And that dress, so cosplayers take note, man. I already take have. Notes. <laughs> <laughs> take notes. Let's let's see this one soon, Celia. Right? All right, so let's get into the big finale. I think this is the one of the bigger um cliffhangers that we've had since that first episode. So they get discovered and Chad, tell us what ensues. Yeah, they kind of have to collect evidence really fast and then make a run for it. And uh, as they do, um, they sort of get separated. Uh, at least uh, Mirage, uh, Freya, and Hayate sort of get separated from the rest of the group and have to find a different way out. They sort of get trapped in one of the hallways and have to go through this little vent that Hayate finds. And they end up coming out in this uh, sort of uh, cavern area. It's got a bunch of catwalks and stairs and platforms and everything around it, and they're not really sure where they are. And uh, when they get out there, they quickly get spotted, and it looks like it was sort of uh, an elaborate trap to get them to this point because they, uh, they get confronted by the aerial knights. And it looks like they're pretty much done for, captured, and uh, yeah, they're not getting out. So, and then the episode pretty much ends at that point, and we're left to wonder what the heck's going to happen next. Bogue was kind of like, oh, look what we have uh, two humans and. Um... Windamirian traitor. Yeah, ouch. Again. Yeah. Burn, Freya. <laughs> yeah, and that was like a really good ending. And I was just like, what? I was that's not it? ready for it to end. I had the same reaction. I'm like, wait, that's it? <laughs> Where's the rest of it? It was great. I was, like, I was that engaged in the episode that when it did end, that I wasn't ready for it to end. I wanted more. Pretty good overall. Another great episode from Macos Delta. Move on to messages. All right. We got our first one from Felipe Cintron. Most of the stuff that he talked about was already answered in this episode about the apples and... Yeah, he says he talks a little bit about the food shipments are part of the VAR syndrome. And that that's specifically the apples and... Uh, and and, and whatnot and uh, like i said i've had that theory going on this show since almost i think episode one i've been talking about how the the apples are going to come into play in some manner uh, or other and i i suspected that it was something where like people who ate the apples were getting var syndrome in some in some way or another and um it kind of seemed to make sense so i think he's just uh, he's on the same wavelength as i am with that that question he has another one um where it's like a tie-in to macross 2 um, where the enemy used singing to motivate and control the troops. Um, 
sort of similar, but a little bit different in this in this respect. In that, uh, most of the troops are already on uh, their own side. Like they don't, uh, they're the Windermereans are pretty much united. I think we haven't really, if we if there are any fractions and stuff like that in the in sorry uh, uh, fractures in sort of the alliance of the Windermereans, we certainly haven't seen it yet. They all seem to be on the same side, um, with uh, only one exception right now, which is Freya. Um, and they're most their the singing is pretty much used um, not necessarily against their enemies, but used against anyone who can sort of forward their interests by manipulation. So I think uh, this is similar, but a little bit different. Um, his third point goes on to some nods back to Macross Zero with the Windermerians. Um, so they may somehow be descendants of Ronka's sister. Yeah, he means um, Mao's. I think right? he means Mao's sister, yeah. And then we have the last point, uh, which uh, when the, he says, when the main singer, forgotten name, sings naked, which I assume he's talking about uh, Sarah, uh, she seemed to be doing the same thing that Ronka's sister, again, I think it's Mao's in Zero, was doing when uh, singing in the ruins. To hear. Oh, so I think she's maybe talking about Mikumo uh, doing the same thing as Mao's sister, I think that's what he, yeah. me he meant to say. Um, to heal the land, maybe she's still working on reinforcing against the Vars uh, when she's doing that, or if she's evil and we don't know it yet, she's spreading the seeds. Um, so it's an interesting theory. Uh, I'm not really sure if, uh, if I, I don't necessarily dis subscribe to the Mikumo being evil yet. Um, and I, I don't think I'm ever going to, if she comes across, if she, if she does, uh, sort of go down that path, um, I think I'll be a kind of surprised by it i think they are intentionally depicting makumo as having like these weird sort of mysterious ways and being off on her own and all the rest of that stuff because there is some plot element that's going to involve her um, and we might have seen a little bit of like the beginning of that here in this episode where she gets separated from everybody else and she goes off and sings and um, does her thing in the protoculture ruins on voldor and uh, but I I don't necessarily believe that she's a plant or like a ruse or you know a spy or a saboteur or anything like that. Um, she doesn't necessarily display anything very saboteur-y right now. No, that's so. a word. I don't think so either. Like she hasn't. I think she's done like so much to actually like you know everything that she's done has sort of uh, helped everybody um, and uh, hasn't really sabotaged anything at this point, whether it's big or small. All right. So uh, moving on, there's a kind of like a conversation between me and Sean Salisbury on the Facebook page, ah, yeah. and the, he had two things that I thought were interesting. One is that he thinks that Hayate could beat Messer when, if they were fighting a Batteroid to Batteroid. Um, not sure if that's true. We haven't really seen Messer fight in Batteroid mode, mostly in Fighter and Gerwalk. So, but that would be an interesting matchup. I'd like to see that. Never going to happen, but I'd like to see that. But um, I guess the big question, which wasn't answered this episode, is who is Lady M and uh, one of the guys or gals that's uh, posting on um, the Macross Delta Facebook page put up a poll. Who do you guys think? Just to guess. Because my opinions of Lady M have changed <laughs> as the series has progressed. Because I used well, to, I used to think it was Mikumo. Yeah. Because like, or no, first I thought it was Mirage because uh, in the pilot episode, Mikumo made that comment about how you know, oh, well, if Lady M were here, I wouldn't be able to go undercover like this. And then it cut to Mirage desperately trying to get a hold of Mikumo. But then they make the comment about how, you know, what's Lady M up to? And they're like, we haven't really heard from her. And and it really, and it can make, gave me the impression that it might have been Mikumo that was Lady M, especially because she goes off on her own quite a bit. But now I'm thinking it might be a genus. And unfortunately for Mirage, I'm leaning more towards Milia which it would put immense pressure on Mirage, <laughs> having her grandmother, who was an excellent pilot, and also mayor in Macross 7, and also a really intense lady calling the shots and being her boss, basically. And yeah, that's it. That's pretty much it as far as this episode. I yeah. think so. I think we covered our bases. We got everything All right. Covered. So, Celia... Where can we find you when you're not doing the Macross Delta recap show? You can find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash Celia Rose Cosplay. And you can find me on Twitter at Planets Twinkle. And Chad, where are you at? 
Uh, you can visit my website, of course, uh, which is the Macross Mecha Manual. And you can also find me on Facebook, which is at uh, facebook.com slash Macross Mecha Manual. You can contact me via email, uh, which is marchingcw at hotmail.com. And lastly, I can be found on various anime message boards, such as ANN, Anime Nation, and Macross World. And this is Exo. You could contact me on Macross World Facebook page. You could contact me also on the Macross World Delta page. Or you could tweet at me at Macross Tweet, the official Macross World Twitter account. And that's it. We'll see you next week for Episode 8, Escape Resonance. Bye.